The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I hope you're getting excited about the trip. So, um, so there are a few things that I managed to skip over last time. One is solar cookers somehow got dropped from my presentation. <laughs> and they're a kind of key part of cooking that I want to talk about. Um, at least most of you guys have investigated a little bit on your own. And then we also just talking about the energy to boil water. So in terms of solar cookers, there, as uh, Grupo Phoenix mentioned, there are three types. So there's the concentrator or par parabolic method, where you have some sort of parabolic collector that's aiming the heat onto your cooking cook stove, which is then heating up the material. You have the box method, which is using a greenhouse method, um, where you have a reflective device uh, reflecting into the greenhouse. And that's pretty much the design that um, Group of Phoenix uses. I wouldn't call it a hybrid because the hybrid has both that greenhouse but also uses some parabolic features to collect the energy. Um, and you can see that the cost, you can imagine the cost of these three devices shown varies. And so you can get very inexpensive versions of all of these. But the parabolic is definitely the hardest to get super cheap um, and very I expensive versions. So I wanted to start by just um, talking about what you think might be some pros and cons of solar cookers. So sheet metal is pretty, uh, yeah, it's hard to get a really good reflection off of it. So I think I've seen some that are like basically mirrors. So um, is I think what that is. Um, this is um, like a plastic that's super shiny that's just laminated onto the cardboard. So a whole range from expensive to non. Uh, is the concentrator weird? Is, what is it concentrating towards? The box or towards? No, so this is an open pan. So this is concentrating it on the pan. So that these, this is the difference. The concentrator is, is just, sh you know, shining a strong ray of heat onto something. Solar cookers are very rarely electrical. I've never seen. But then that would have definitely. We were thinking about like the panel outside on the roof, collecting, collecting the rays, collecting the like solar energy, make, transferring it into like electrical energy, and uh, getting it to to the solar cooker and the solar. So cooker. I think that would be a really good estimation exercise to figure out what it takes to make a solar cooker that's an electrical solar cooker. Um, because do you remember how many watts a typical stove or oven is? A lot. Yeah, and so like a typical like burner is a thousand to fifteen hundred watts. A typical oven is three thousand watts. So we're talking really different s scopes in terms of what a cell phone charger is and what cooking is needs to be, and so. Um, the, that's a high barrier to entry, so you need to look into the viability of that. Okay, so can we make a list of what you think are the bonuses of solar cookers and what are some of the drawbacks, Benji? Um, it's free after you buy it. Yeah, so it's free energy. Zero yeah. A 
con is that you might not be able to have it right outside your home, like that girl standing in a river, which is probably not outside your home. <laughs> um, so, uh, how do we, so it needs to be, like, it needs to be outside. Find a sunny location. Yeah. Your, your, your cooking options are limited. So yeah, you can absolutely fry food with the concentrator, but it can be hard to get a low heat if you want a low heat in a concentrator. Carter, excuse me? Portability. Portability. Yeah, so I'll put that in the middle. <sighs> Well, and there's a real. Well, but you can see here. So, like this is a highly portable solar cooker. That that parabolic concentrator actually folds up into something that's not much bigger. Like it's significantly smaller than this. So that is super portable. Whereas the concentrate that concentrator is a fixed location. So some are portable, some are not. Um, and then if they're portable, that can be helpful, but then it's limited by size. So I think actually leaving it in the middle is reasonable. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I don't know if that is tr any more true than it is for any stove. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Yeah, let me see. Yeah, so no emissions, which yields better health. Yeah, so no, no fuel collection, which sort of links to that one. So, because it's either time or money generally. Sid? I guess a uh, con would be that you can constantly like, change the angle that yeah. you're cooking for a for long period of time. So, um, OK. Yeah, Benji. For fires, you can use the lights around it also. It just doesn't necessarily have the added benefits. So if someone, you know, if someone wants to have, I don't know, you just sort of, I mean, you're not using any energy anyways, that's not like they're wasting. Yep. So, because people do use their fires for heating, for mosquito control, for light sometimes. Yeah. Okay, super. So I think that's a pretty good list. To give you some background, solar cookers were invented in the mid 1700s. So they've been around for a really long time. And I think that is an indicator of how this is a great technology in some cases, but isn't ever going to be the killer app that solves the world's cooking challenges. Uh, because one would think if they've been around since the 1700s that the refinement that takes it to killer app would have been developed already. But the cons of it, weather dependent, it's time dependent, it, you need to be in a sunny location, you need to be outside, are all really huge. Um, so some of the challenges with the concentrators are the glare and just how hot it is. So it's kind of hard to see because the um, quality of the picture has gone down going through the projector, but this woman is sort of grimacing <laughs> because it's so bright that it's actually hard to um, 
to deal with and it's also um very hot where it is yeah dangerous. yeah so the the concentrators in particular are dangerous and so people are really concerned especially with kids um you know it's it, you getting not permanently but temporary blinded or burned um there's also issues that you can imagine how easy that would be Hola. <laughs> So I have a really quick question for all of you. Anyone wearing shoes with laces? Can you please stand up? And the rest of you just look around and get a good look at um, who who has laces and who doesn't. This thing clipped on here. Okay, thank you guys. You can sit down. Um, so I, I hate to break it to you like this, um, but you know I can see a lot of the way you tied your laces, and a lot of you just use like the simple like bunny ears kind of knot you learned when you were like five or six, you know, which was great when you learned it and worked well. Um, but honestly, now it's kind of a dumb knot to use. Uh, I know you've been using it your whole life, but um, you know, I, I can stand up here and tell you that because, uh, so I'm a, I'm a graduate student here in mechanical engineering, um, which if you haven't heard is probably the best mechanical engineering department in the world. Um, so you know, I've learned all about design and like good designs and bad designs. Um, and these bunny ear knots are, are pretty bad designs. Um, you know, and if you want, we could sit here and analyze the stresses in them and, and kind of where our the equilibrium points and why does it stay tied and why does it always come untied. Um, but you know, the summary of all that is just, it's a bad knot and you guys should learn uh, a new one. Uh, but thankfully, I'm, I'm here and I'm gonna go through and, and teach you how to tie a better knot. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of step out of that character and ask you just real quickly to share kind of thoughts or feelings of that experience and kind of what I said or what I did that made you think or feel the way you are now? I don't actually use the bunny ear. Okay. <laughs> so that works. Other? Anyone else? Yeah, he whispered to me. He's like, I don't even have my shoes tied. <laughs> <laughs> In the um, back. You pointed out people who were doing it wrong, which might make them feel bad, though I don't think people here actually feel too bad about the way they tied their shoes. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Say again? How have you been? Dude, I've been well. Um, so, yeah, so, any other thoughts about how I came across? I, I obviously have this idea that I want to get you to learn how to tie your shoes differently. Do you think that was the best approach? So, it was good because you're really confident, and so it was easy to listen to you, and your kind of argument and the flow of your conversation was really easy to follow. But I also think you were overconfident for such a simple topic. And in fact, I also you brought uh, the whole MIT thing. I think for us it's good because we're all at MIT, of course, but I don't know how that would go with other people. Like, so you think you're, I don't know. It seemed like you, were just, you thought you were better than us. Cause like arrogant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah that was trying to be. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, I also, I assume there's a problem, right? I assume that you're not happy with the way you're tying your shoes, right? And I said, oh, this is a better way. Um, and like you said, I ostracized someone who tied their shoes differently. Um, I didn't introduce myself at all. I just kind of <laughs> barged in here and said, hey, let me tell you about this. Right? Just the personal connection is a pretty important thing when you're working with people. Um, you know, also, I didn't really ask any information from you other than could you stand up if you have shoes that tie with laces. Right? There is no other exchange of information. Right? And so if I'm coming in here and I'm trying to help you with what I assume is a problem. It, you know, it's good to interact and get some kind of information from you guys. Um, and, and also, uh, I kind of imposed my value of keeping shoes tied for a long time over what might be a value of ease to tie your shoe or ease to untie your shoe or just familiarity or the way the knot looks. You like the way it looks, so you're going to tie the bunny ears over some other knot. Right, so I kind of just assumed all these things and just put them on you and said, hey, here's a better way of doing it. So 
I wanted to use it as a simple illustration of some circumstances you might find yourself in going to Nicaragua soon um, when you're working with uh, people there on the projects that you've, you've been working on so far, where you're going into an entirely different culture, right? Working in communities where you really don't know how everything works. Um, and it, it'd be really easy to come across in these same kinds of ways. Um, so I wanted to just take a minute, if we can, to divide up into the teams, right? You guys have been working in teams. Um, and just talk about how you might approach a situation where you show up to a community, you have a community partner, and you, know, you have the project that you've been working on all term. And um, I guess how would you go about approaching the situation where you just show up, you get out of the van or you get off the, the back of the truck and you're all right, you show up, what do you do? How do you approach the, the leaders that you interact with or just the, the people there? Um, and so I, I, I remember last year we had about four teams or so. Okay, so three teams, that actually works perfectly. Um, and right before we do this, I'll introduce myself a little more. I'm Steve Ray, I know some, uh, some of you. I'm a PhD student in mechanical engineering here and helped out with D-Lab Energy last year. Uh, but in order to graduate, I need to spend a little more time on my dissertation this year, so I couldn't help out more than this. Um, but yeah, that's it. I went to, the, to Nicaragua last year, and it was a great time. So you guys should be pumped. Do you leave like Friday or Saturday? Sunday, okay, cool. Well, good. So let's just break up and then we can quickly talk about it and the three of us will kind of just help facilitate and help you guys think about how you could kind of approach this in a, in a positive way. I just want to mention that the shoe tying I think is very comparable to cooking. So you guys have been cooking, shoe, shoeing tying your shoes since kindergarten-ish and most people have been in the kitchen since before they could walk um, and cooking you know, from seven or eight years old, and so coming in and saying you're cooking wrong, um, which is somewhat what some of us are saying, you know, hopefully not the easiest <laughs> um, but fundamentally suggesting changes is comparable that, you know, like, it sounds ludicrous, and what are you talking about at the same level? Yeah, and sometimes if there's like a, something that's relatively new, you might not even be aware of the problems with it because you've just been doing it the same way the whole time. Um, so if you observe something and they and you ask them, do you have any problems with this or things you can improve? And they say, oh, not really. Like it works pretty well. And if you see things that are that you think could be improved, you could ask them, well, you know, what do you think about decreasing the time for this to to work by making this change or something like that? Where um, you know, it might not be totally apparent, but you can still ask them how they would view it. But starting with what they see is huge. Yeah, yeah. So what they're doing. Ask them if they like it. And if they and I think I'm like they're, they're really proud and they're yeah. still like, there's yeah. 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 plenty of flaws. Yeah. And so being, being cutting carefully there so that you can be respecting what they've accomplished yeah. while providing positive ideas yeah. for changes. Thanks. All right. So I know that was kind of bizarre and weird, but um, for some of the communities, you're sort of walking in while they're going about their daily lives and getting completely interrupted so that you could talk to them. Um, and so just thinking about how awkward and weird that felt, and therefore what you can do that wasn't like what Steve did, because he was definitely doing worst case scenario in order to minimize that awkwardness and weirdness. Um, so back to solar cookers. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we were talking about the concentrator. It can be so hot as to be dangerous, especially for kids, but really for everyone. Um, you can see that is a big wind catcher, so they can blow over pretty easily. That's actually an issue with the group of Phoenix uh, solar cookers too, because this panel is so big that it catches in the wind. Um, and then you c it's, there's also a risk of when you're stirring, spilling food onto the reflector and then damaging the reflector and how well it works. So there's some real drawbacks from the parabolic. From the greenhouse, um, it's a lower temperature and so you can really only cook certain things. Um, but there's no burning happening and you really don't need to pay much attention to it apart from adjusting the, sun, the angle to the sun. Um, and then the combo has some of the pros and some of the cons of the others. 
Uh, so we talked about the benefits are pretty, um, oh, and the other thing here is like, you really can't stir this, right? Because as soon as you open it up, uh, you're, you're losing all your, your heat and you have to start all over again. So it's, it's a challenging device. Uh, so boxes are made out of almost anything. Like okay. I've seen plastic, I've seen wood, I've seen metal. So, yeah. Um, so some of the challenges that people can be frustrated about in addition. So one is that you have to cook outdoors. And so in cultures where cooking indoors is standard, cooking outdoors po poses a lot of challenges. So one is just the need for privacy. Another is r just risks of theft of either your food and or your cooker. Um, and it's also, for people who are used to cooking around a fire, it's a little less social, uh, or can be, and so that can be a, a flip side of frustration. Um, the super affordable ones, like this one, is made out of cardboard, and so they don't last very long because termites tend to eat them or other insects, uh, but they're very inexpensive. Um, and then they use a plastic bag just as your cover for your greenhouse, and again, very inexpensive but pretty short life. Um, and so then you have, with all these things breaking down, you have a supply chain issue of you need to make sure that people are able to get replacements um, and able to afford replacements. Um, the size, oftentimes, uh, I sort of gave you a hard time, Carter, about the size thing, um, but it's true that actually a lot of the times they're relatively small for how much they can cook, and so you can't always cook for all of your family members, so that's frustrating. There was an interesting sort of case study where solar cookers were brought uh, to Kakuma, which is a Kenyan refugee camp for uh, refugees from the Sudan. And the Solar Cookers International gave away a bunch of cookers. And they, there was, it was actually this cooker right here. And um, so they, people were getting their solar cookers for free. And Cooking was a huge issue in these refugee camps because women were having to leave the camp in order to get firewood, and when they were, they were regularly raped, and so they needed an alternative um, pretty severe, severely because there was no safe option for cooking, and they also were spending over 50% of their income on firewood uh, if they were buying it, uh, so really outrageous. And in the end, what they found is that less than 20% of people ended up using the solar cookers more than one or two days per week. So that's a pretty low rate of usage um, for something when you're facing really severe costs either to your bodily well-being or your income um, that severe. So I think that speaks to the challenges of solar cooker adoption, that um, people don't love to use them. Used to it, or were there any major kind of design flaws that made them useless? Or? Well, so people really don't like them. Like these cookers work, um, but all of these real issues, like you can only cook during l for lunch, basically. You can't cook for breakfast. You can't cook for dinner. Um, you can only cook cer certain types of foods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, make them a really limit of limited value. Um, so on the flip side, uh, at Kakuma, is that there were a bunch of single men there. Um, who were separated from their families. So normally um, in the Sudan, I am talking about Sudan, yeah, um, in the Sudan, um, if you're a single guy, your mom cooks for you. And it's not normal for men to cook at all. So either your wife or your mom is cooking for you. And so these single men were separated from their moms, so they didn't have anyone to cook with. And it was really socially inappropriate for them to cook with wood. And so they were actually the adopters who used the solar cookers because it was appropriate for them to use these because they're really not considered stoves the way a firewood stove would be considered a stove. So that was the success story, was that when you needed a radically different um, option, it was, it was relatively well adopted. Um, so yeah, so, and the other aspect is that th the, in this camp, there was a food scarcity also, which is unsurprising. And so asking people to uh, experiment with how they cook when they don't know if they have enough food is a huge um, request of people. And so I think that's part of the reason for the lack of adoption was that I'm not willing to try this wacky stove because what if I ruin my food? That means I don't eat today and I don't know when I'll be eating very much. Um, so that was the, the summary, summary of solar cookers. Are there any questions on solar cookers? I'm sorry I dropped that over the charcoal lecture that, or stove lecture that would have been the time to do it, I don't know how it got lost. OK, so now we're finally going to talk about the trip a bit, um, sort of 
reverting back to what Steve was talking about. This lecture is a little bouncing around intentionally so that Steve could interrupt us. Um, <laughs> so uh, the trip goals are number one, to have some well un identified, well understood, and well documented projects. Um, ideally, highly relevant to D-Lab Energy. However, if you uh, find some that are not at all energy projects, but are seem like interesting projects, we can often take these projects and feed them into D-Lab Design or other D-Lab classes. So if you learn about some others, feel free to document them. It's really helpful to D-Lab as a community to have those extra projects. Um, and then we've talked about a few projects for you guys. There may be others that come up that are either ideal for you to work on this semester, and that's fine to change course like that, and or for you to, um, for future generations of D-Lab Energy students to work on. So please document any projects you come across. Um, and I will be getting you on Friday the sheet of how to document so that you have a good sense of what information you need to gather, but hopefully you're, we're also getting that today. Um, second is to really understand the communities you're working in so you can do a good job of designing with and for them. Um, what are their needs? What are their finances? What is their health, their education, culture, government, um, both you know, less critically, though some somewhat critically in terms of understanding when grids arrive, the formal government, also like the informal community government that exists. Um, and along those lines, formal, informal leaders, lifestyles, um, work, etc. And then doing the charcoal trainings slash creative capacity building as appropriate. So I want to talk a little bit about creative capacity building, which is a term that Amy Smith coined for the way that she um, hopes that all D-Lab groups can work. So I want to talk about what she did um, at a refugee camp in Uganda as an example. Uh, so this is a relief camp for refugees in Uganda. It looks kind of picturesque, but each one of those huts uh, is about 10 or 12 feet in diameter and houses 20 people generally. And they've been living there for 20 to 30 years. Um, so there's plenty of people who have grown up in this refugee camp. Um, it's their choice is to be there or to be completely unsafe if they're not in the refugee camp, um, either getting killed or getting um, enlisted into the army. Um, and because they're in a camp, there's really no natural resources or ability to do work, so there's a real culture of dependency. Um, things are finally safe enough that this group of people is getting, and it's about 100,000 people, a um, group of people is getting ready to get repatriated back to um, their original homes. Um, but people have basically lived there their whole lives, and so there's this culture of dependency. How are we going to adjust back to home? Um, they're used to a very centralized life in camp um, and adjusting back, and especially the burden on the women going back is very high because all of a sudden they now have to be figuring out how to cook all the food, get all the water, get all the wood, etc. Um, and there's been very little capacity building in this camp up to now. Um, so what Amy did when she was invited there um, was initially do a technology demonstration with a sort of classic D-Lab technology, which is corn shellers. And if you're curious about them, they're on the back shelf back there, so you can check them out. But basically, um, the corn sheller, uh, people generally cor shell corn by hand. It's really labor intensive and relatively painful to do because the corn is dry and it's really hard to get off. Um, and so D-Lab identified this injection molded corn sheller as something that could work in a lot of communities really well, but it's really hard to injection mold at the community level. It requires really high pressure and plastic, neither of which are available. And so D-Lab developed two ways of making that corn sheller, either by welding or by bending sheet metal that are really easy to make basically anywhere and allow people to shell their own corn very quickly, very affordably. Um, and people really loved it, so they, they were really excited. Um, and so this is Kofi who traveled with Amy and is another D-Lab staff member. Um, they taught them how to make their own corn shellers and people were really pumped. And so this is both just a tech transfer, sort of like doing a charcoal demonstration. I'm teaching you how to make these corn shellers and hopefully you can start making them for yourselves and using them. Awesome. But also to start inspiring conversation about, well, what else do you need and how else could it be, how could those needs be addressed together? Um, and so one of the projects that was discussed was uh, grinding, so grinding their corn. This is a traditional grinding stone. You can imagine how hard it is to use this stone to successfully grind dried corn, um, how labor intensive it is. And people found it, uh, they also, or actually, not corn, excuse me, they grind sesame and ground nuts, which are peanuts in it. Um, and again, it's very labor intensive. So first, so that was the issue posed, was how do we grind our, our 
uh, sesame and peanuts more easily. And so first they looked at what the commercial method is in that area as a commercial grinder, which requires diesel um, and is totally unaffordable for this community. So they said, all right, that's not going to work. So let's design our own. And so in a day, they found a meat grinder and put together this really basic, crappy prototype. Um, and partly it was crappy because they had a day, and partly it was, in, it was crappy intentionally because they built this with community partners. Um, Amy and Kofi really took the lead, but working very closely with the local builders as well as the local people. And so people got a really good sense of how one could develop this project really fast without the fancy MIT education that Amy brings to the table. But just they got their head around, oh, this is how I could do this, and got really excited. And they also saw how relatively crappy this was and how there needed to be improvements and so they started saying things like when I build mine I'm gonna do this which is a really good indicator that they're now feeling empowered to build their own rather than when you come back and build me another one it's gonna look like this right and that's the, that's the goal is right when I build mine rather than when you come back and build me mine uh, so people got really excited um, and just tried it out um, and it was a great outcome so uh, this sort of experience helped Amy solidify her thinking about creative capacity building, which is we're not there for just for tech transfer. We're not there just to identify problems and then come back to MIT and fix them, but working with people side by side through all areas of the design process to help them develop their own solutions to problems and work together with them. And the nature of a D-Lab trip going for a week in spring break is we can't fully achieve all of this, but at least if we have this in mind, we can achieve as much of it as possible. Um, some of the amazing things that happened on this trip is that um, the translator they were working with told them that they, they were the first um, foreigners that this camp had ever seen who actually did work. Because most people who come to do relief work come with clipboards and do a lot of interviews and ask a lot of questions. Um, this is not to attack all relief work, right? There's a lot of great relief work that goes on, but there's also a lot of clipboard question asking. And there's a need for that, but um, actually having people come and do work and work side by side is pretty valuable. So for an example, here's Kofi chopping wood for f making fires, because that's what needed to be done, so he helped out doing it. And that's the kind of thing that you might start to do when you're in your community next week. Um, However, you don't see a picture of Amy chopping wood, but you do see a picture of Amy helping sweep up after the demonstration. Um, and why is that? Well, it's totally culturally inappropriate for Amy to chop wood, just as it would be inappropriate for Kofi to help sweep up. And so while it's great to break down gender barriers at some level, you also need to be respectful. And so Amy will happily chop firewood when given the opportunity, but if it's totally inappropriate, she won't, and vice versa. So it's a balancing act about helping people um, but also being respectful of what's appropriate. So it can be very easy in communities to let people just help you. People will be really kind and gracious and serve you. And it's really important to make sure that you're acting as a community member working rather than someone who's a visitor or guest, even though you are um, only being helped. Um, and the general rule of thumb is, that Amy likes to say is people are people. So if it's, uh, you would help someone out here doing something, you should do it there um, and vice versa. If you'd be really uncomfortable helping X here, then you don't need to be, force yourself to be super uncomfortable there. Um, some of the advantages of doing this sort of participatory work are it's efficient. And that's a sort of deceptive thing to say it's efficient because it takes a really long time and can be really frustrating. However, if you're delivering a product that no one actually needs or is excited about, then there's a real loss of efficiency there by not working with them in the first place. Um, and similarly, it can be effective to really work with people and get a, something that's really valuable. Um, it can help transition people to a level of self-reliance they didn't have previously and help um, your projects and the work become sustainable. Um, some of the disadvantages are it's slow, it takes a long time, um, it requires a lot of human and material resources potentially, there's a lot of unpredictability as most teams have already experienced and if you haven't you will experience um, and you have to be able to just roll with that unpredictability rather than getting super frustrated by it. I mean you will get super frustrated by it but not letting that frustration be the dominant experience. Um, and then finally ex managing expectations both of not um, getting your community partners thinking that you're going to 
do something magical that isn't actually within your power, or vice versa, you yourself thinking you're going to be doing something amazing that's actually not reasonable to expect in the time and re with the resources you have. Uh, so the typical design process is you're trying to go from a problem to solution, and you generally go through generating ideas, evaluating them, designing in more detail, actually building, testing, and evaluation. It's not actually this lin linear, of course, but that's the general idea. And so traditionally, um, <coughs> you would involve communities just at the end. Um, and that's obviously not ideal for all the reasons we've talked about. And so then hopefully you involve them in the beginning. And the idea of co-creation is that you're involving your community throughout all stages. And so one thing to talk about when you are there is, all right, I'm not going to be here for the next few weeks while I'm doing all these steps. How can I stay connected with you? What's the best way, way to be in contact with you um, so that you can involve your community partners as much as possible? Are there any questions about all that? Yeah. Do you mean like with the, like we have Lindsay, do you mean with the people there? In, like with, with so all, everyone. So Lindsay is both really useful as a go-between, um, but she also can't answer all the questions that you are going to have, because um, Lindsay is one of the organizers of Grupo Phoenix. Um, and so, Lindsay may be the person you need to use to get the answers from the women you're working with, but you can't just rely on Lindsay um, reasonably, but she may be the best way to get information. So speaking of information, um, I want to talk a little bit about what the barriers are to getting inf good information and some of the methods. So what makes getting good information hard and what would you do? to get good information. And by information, I mean learning, you know, is this uh, solar cooker design actually a good idea? Uh, how often do you cook with the solar cooker, et cetera, et cetera? So, yeah? Language. Language, yeah. What else? Whichever. Well, I think both, actually. What else? Cultural? Yeah. Absolutely. I think time is an issue since we're only there for one week and we're all very ambitious. We'll want to get the most out of it. And maybe like we'll want to like kind of bypass the small little things that to them may make a big difference. Like introducing ourselves and making that establishing a personal contact that this guy didn't have. Yeah, yeah. You can get much better information from people if you actually spend the time to do the introductions. And thankfully for you guys. You're not in a community where it's traditional to spend like an hour doing the introdu introductions and how's your family and this and that. In Nicaragua, at least in these areas, people are used to doing things a little more quickly, but doing the Steve Ray approach, <laughs> not his approach, but what he did of barging right in and being like, oh, let me see your shoelaces, is probably not the best. Um, spending the time to introduce yourself and get to know people a little bit is definitely going to help. Okay, so... Gender? Yep. Nicaragua doesn't have very much of like 
men over women kind of thing? It depends who you talk to, um, but I would say it's not as extreme as other places. Is age going to be a problem? Like, are they going to have trouble respecting people that are younger than them? Um, I don't know. It could be. I didn't encounter it as a big issue, but it's, it's always a possibility. So some of the issues I have encountered myself are, so yes, the language, and sometimes you deal with that with the translator, whether it's someone on your team or someone on your, in your community organization is helping. Um, educational backgrounds are different. Cultural backgrounds are different. People tell you what you want to hear, what they think you want to hear, as opposed to what you actually want to hear. Um, and you may be easily talking to the wrong person. So to get into those a little more, so language obviously um, is challenging. And when you use a translator, there's often times where you ask a question that you know takes you two minutes to say, and the translator asks a one second question. And then the person responds, by talking for three minutes, and the translator says, yes. <laughs> um, and that can be really frustrating. And at the same time, you're completely beholden to your translator. So if you take them outside and yell at them, I mean, I don't think that's going to happen, right? But if, that, you know, if you took a really pissed off approach to this, the effect would be um, even worse response from your translator. Um, educational backgrounds. So what I mean by that is that most of us are pretty used to talking in watts, in joules, in inches, whatever, in units, and just with a math sense. And if you haven't had a math education, you may have a really intuitive understanding of all those concepts, but you don't actually have the language, the same language. Um, so it's not a Spanish versus English barrier, it's an educational language barrier. And so you are, it's beholden on you when some, you say, well, how long is that? Expecting three inches and someone you know, answers like, well, you know, some other analogy, figuring out how to translate that, rather than saying, well, is that six inches or eight inches, right? Because that's not going to give you very useful information. And it's a centimeter thing, right? Don't I saw both. Really? Yeah. Um, but a lot of it is without standard units, too. Like, a lot of people just aren't used to units and units of measure, like um, what you're used to. Um, cultural background, of course. Um, and then telling you what you want to hear, it's really common if you say, so what do you think of my design? Right? People will be like, oh, it's great. Yeah, we totally use that. Awesome. Love it. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. And unless you both ask your question more carefully and keep probing, you'll never hear beyond that. And it's really easy when you're proud of something to be like, well, they said they love it. Awesome. And so working through that is, is important. And then also talking to the wrong person. So it can be really easy to ask all your questions of Lindsay, for example, as the community org organizer. And she speaks English, et cetera. And she'll give you some really good insights. But if you just talk to her, you won't get the right information. Or you can interview someone about cooking habits. And then if you forget to ask, how often do you cook, and find out actually they aren't the cook, but they'll answer because you're asking these questions. If you don't ask the right questions, you're just never going to get the right information. And there's classic examples of that in terms of talking to the male leaders in the community and never talking to the women in the community, I think that'll be less of an issue for most of you guys, given who you're working with. But it's something to keep in mind. So I sort of got to this, and you got to it too. So one, uh, some of the methods to manage this are asking the same person the same question in many different ways multiple times, as well as asking different people the same question multiple times, anticipating that you're going to get some variation. Another thing you can do is ask some questions that you kind of already know the answer to, um, if, if you do, so that you can get an indicator of how reliable this person is in terms of giving you useful information. Because some people are much more on the telling you what you want, what they think you want to hear side than others. And there's some pro probing questions you might be able to develop that um, can help you get around that. Um, demonstrating an openness to criticism, and that generally does not mean saying, oh, you won't offend me, tell me whatever you want, but can mean something like, you know, I've talked to some people who've criticized or, you know, have said they don't like this idea because of this. You know, is that something that you, you think might be a problem too? Why or why not? Um, and just repeatedly attacking yourself so that, that you actually get some criticisms from them because as great as you all are, I'm sure there's going to be some f flaws in ev every approach. And so getting to those flaws helps you get to a really great product faster. Um, repeating answers back is sort of a classic method for g making sure that 
there's understanding on both sides, encouraging questions very explicitly saying, you know, what questions do you have for me? What can I tell you? Um, is pretty important. Uh, verifying expertise. So sort of as I mentioned with the wrong person, if you talk to someone about cooking, actually making sure that they cook would be a good, good thing to do. Um, and then finally, dealing with the translator, spending some time beforehand talking about what your goals are, what your preferences are, um, because translators have choices in terms of do they give you the detailed response or do they just give you the yes. And if you're on a time crunch, you may just want the yes. But if you have the time, you probably want the detailed um, answer with the subtleties, even if it's more painful to translate. So one of the challenges is when you're working on engineering projects is getting to the core problem. Um, and that sort of ties in to the project specifications. So someone will say, I need a new stove instead of I need to not have such a smoky environment in my kitchen. And you need to make sure you're asking the questions to get to smoky environment, not new stove. right? And be really easy to specify that brand new stove without um, getting uh, the right and question answered, which is the smoky environment. So partly it's making sure that you're not letting them design for you, which everyone does. It's really hard to describe what you need in terms of specifications, as you probably just found out um, or saw in that 2009 lecture I linked to when trying to describe a lemon or a piece of fruit um, as a project specification rather than I need a lemon. <laughs> right? um, that's a, much harder, but that's what you. this is actually the information you need to make a good design so that you're not going down the path of a design that may not actually match the real needs um, because it's easier to think in products than in specifications. Uh, so getting to the core problem, some ways you can do that in addition to just being patient when people talk about what they want in terms of a product and then you translating back into the specifications is, so tell me what would happen when you use this new thing. Tell me a story about what that would be like and have them sort of walk you through what life is like with this new option. Um, talk, you know, when you're trying to find out more about what those specifications are, rather than saying, how big should it be? Saying, well, how big is too big? Is 10 feet, you know, is, is this big too big? Is this big too big? And again, I just said 10 feet, and that's probably not what you want to say. You want to use your hands to gesture or use other, some other things to compare, because 10 feet, even for us, is a little hard to imagine exactly how big 10 feet is. And for someone who hasn't grown up using um, rulers and tape measures, et cetera, it's harder. Um, and so I put big and small in parentheses, because it could be like how hot, how cold, how whatever, all sorts of different things. Um, challenge, challenge their requests. So like if they say, oh no, it has to be, you know, it, it can't be bigger than this. Say, well, what would happen if it was this big? Why would that be a bad thing? So that you really understand what they're getting at. Um, and then get, getting feedback on your own ideas, including ones that you know are problematic. So showing them a design that you know has some issues and getting feedback on it, trying to get them comfortable with criticizing um, so that you can, and then also listening to the way they're criticizing, what they're ca catching, maybe open up some information for you. Um, and then finally, as you're engaged in these questions and conversations, taking time mentally um, to review what you know and sort of do a mental design process of writing down the specifications and being like, okay, I know these things, what else don't I know, so that you make sure to get to all the questions you need to ask. And it's kind of hard and takes practice, but you guys will uh, do great. So now um, I'm going to save that till Friday because we're running out of time. Um, so I just wanted to go over, or maybe I'll go back to it if I have time, um, the packing list and trip uh, advice, which is all posted on Stellar, but in case you haven't had a chance to read it, I know they're kind of long. Um, so some people were earlier asking me, do I need to buy a new X? Um, probably not. So there might be one or two things you want to buy, but generally, the goal of DLab is not to make yourself broke going to travel to a developing country. Um, so very little needs to be bought new and pack lightly, which is in direct contradiction to the two-page packing list that I provided you. But basically, that two-page packing list is the list of all things that someone at DLab really likes bringing. And so some people really value certain things. Other people bring value other things. You sort of have to know yourself what are the 
objects that are going to be important for you to have and what are the ones that you can skip. So there's just a couple that I have on that packing list that are in blue. I didn't even put underwear in blue, right? Just the ones like a flashlight that if you don't have, it's going to be really hard for you to function. So things like that, you have to have everything else is sort of your call. So if you don't have Tevas, you don't have hiking boots, you don't have whatever, don't worry about it. Um, don't go out and buy yourself a 200 pair of hiking boots um, that you'll never wear again just for this trip. That's not necessary. Um, so pack lightly. Um, with that being said, it can be as cold as like 50 degrees at night, so you might want a light fleece or something like that. And then in the middle of the day, it's wicked hot and humid. Um, relatively conservative dress. Again, um, for a lot of these things, I'm asking you to be more conservative than you may see most people being, not most, but many people in Nicaragua being. Um, because again, we're representing MIT and D-Lab and the yada yada. And so we want to be respectful to the people who are on the conservative side in terms of dress, et cetera. Um, toiletries, so if you have any medications that you need to take, you should take twice as many as you need and keep them in two separate places so that if the bag gets stolen or lost, you have your meds. Um, you definitely want to bring toilet paper or tissues or something like that you can use for toilet paper because not all places will have it. Um, you won't be offered a towel. So if you want to have a towel for showering, which will be bucket showers, um, so taking a scoop of water from a bucket and pouring it on your head, um, you should bring one, but I would bring a small one because they're pretty bulky. Um, you definitely want bug repellent and sunscreen. The sun is much stronger, and um, you will sunburn if you don't wear sunscreen if you're fair-skinned. Um, flashlight, again, is key. Having a photocopy of your passport, um, bringing a notebook, like I mentioned, um, and then nothing of value, so you shouldn't be wearing your brass rats. Um, you could skip earrings or re wear really small, subtle ones. Um, cameras, like a small, junky point-and-shoot is fine, but a DLSR is not ideal. Um, again, you'll see some people in Nicaragua with DLSRs, but they're making the choice for themselves about having that and therefore bringing the potential crime associated with having a fancy device there. And it's not fair for you to make that call for your entire team um, on that camera. Yeah. What kind of risk are we talking about? Like, mine is actually waterproof and shock, or is it theft? Theft. So do you have a point? Do you have a waterproof, shockproof DLSR? What's a DLSR? This is like the big. No, not the yeah, big yeah. one. So, hands, so a point and shoot, totally point. fine. Yeah, oh, yeah. So this is what I'm shoot. saying. Okay, so like <laughs> a camera that's this size is fine. A camera that's that size, not fine. <laughs> is what I'm saying. Um, ones that have like the switch outable lenses is a DLSR. You know, fancy, nice camera. That's what I'm asking you not to take. Point and shoot, you should totally take. Um, and then yeah, laptops, um, your team probably shouldn't bring any laptops. If you need to, you should bring one, um, but definitely not more than that. Um, yeah. Do you recommend bringing more than one memory card for camera? Yes, so I recommend bringing as much memory and battery charging capability as you can, um, both because you'll have limited access to electricity for battery charging, and then you may be taking a lot of pictures, and um, you may not have a laptop and be able to download them until you get home. I'm not sure why that's. Uh, yeah. Um, so the thing that's complicated is so every trip leader will have a cell phone with them. So for emergencies, there's a way to call the states or a way to call within your country or whatever you need. Um, I can't see why you'd need a cell phone. Um, like it might be nice to have during your layovers or whatever, so you might want to bring it for that reason. But if it's anything at all nice, and I'm concluding like my junky phone as nice, um, but anything that looks fancier than like flip phones that people had like 10 years ago um, should never be sh visible in Nicaragua. So if you're going to bring it, pack it in the bottom of your bag as soon, you know, as, soon as you get to Miami um, and leave it there um, rather than taking it out. So, and again, like you'll see a few people with iPhones, but in Nicaragua, but they're taking a risk and you shouldn't have yours out and about while you're there. Um, but the one thing is that most of you are leaving super, super early on Sunday. So you do want to have your cell phone out that morning or <laughs> that middle of the night just to make sure you're awake. Um, I don't know, at 3 a.m., like I feel like most of you probably won't even sleep, right? Like I don't, I don't go to sleep if I have to leave at 3. Um, but yeah, we want to make sure you get there. 
Um, so one other thing you want to bring is gifts for your community partners. Um, and so some criteria for what makes a good gift is one that is not extravagantly over the top expensive because it can sort of set up a, the disparity between wealth can be more um, significant and make people feel uncomfortable. Um, also, you may well be on a budget and I don't want you to go broke buying gifts for your family. Um, other things are, will they actually use it? Will this just become some piece of trash that um, adds trash to the community um, in places where they're relatively pristine and we, or not, but we don't want to be adding to the trash load, et cetera. Um, so D-Lab has a few things that we um, buy that are branded as D-Lab objects that you can um, buy from D-Lab. So gifts are not something that D-Lab pays for. It's something that you pay for as a team or an individual um, because they're from you. Um, and so it's up to you to decide how much, but I think something is appropriate. Um, so sports bottles are $5. These hats are maybe 6 or $8. Um, hats, I think, are a pretty good gift because people can wear them and they like them, and a lot of people wear baseball caps. Um, but don't bring them Red Sox caps because most of them like Yankees. <laughs> and those are the only two teams that are basically known from what I saw. Um, we also have these little flashlights. Um, Oh, I think the battery is blocked, so I can't turn it on. But yeah, um, the, the challenge with these flashlights is it means the battery has to be replaced and things like that. So it's a mixed bag, um, how valuable it is. But they're, they're fun. Um, these little drawstring bags, um, which people like. Um, I often bring chocolate to share with my family. Like I'll bring a couple hats to bring for like someone like Lindsay or someone who's helping you a lot. And then for the family, just bring chocolate that you can share with them. Um, Trader Joe's sells pretty good, pretty cheap chocolate that tra travels pretty well. Some chocolate melts really easily and that's not ideal for given how hot it is. Um, but some of the nicer chocolate comes in like three packs for like two bucks. Um, and just sharing that with your family, it means something you can share with all the members um, and is nice and is from your home country. Chocolate in Nicaragua, in my opinion, isn't far inferior to chocolate in the States. Um, and uh, a lot of people I know agree. Um, and so something like that is also appropriate. So are there any questions on gifts? Um, so I'm trying to leave a little time at the end of this cl class so that your team can make a list of all the things you need from D-Lab and these gift things are among them. Um, in terms of money that you might need, uh, so you should bring your Charlie card because you'll probably be coming back on the T if not going there. Um, there's an entry visa cost to get into Nicaragua of $10 and if you just have a $10 bill on you, it's nice to not have to deal with the customs agent making change. Um, if you're bringing cash, so you may want some cash um, for food that's not already prepaid, um, which you guys will reimburse us for after the trip, or um, for gifts for yourself to bring home. To, for yourself or family members um, at the airport. If not, while you're traveling, there'll be opportunities to do a little shopping. Um, so you shouldn't bring anything bigger than a $20 bill. Um, and smaller bills are nicer, generally, because it's hard for people to make change. Um, but the bills should be in decent condition. If they're really ratty, people won't take them. Um, and then if you expect to be needing to use your bank or credit card, or debit card for either for general just getting money out of an ATM or for an emergency, you should call them to warn them that you're traveling so that if you do need it, you can, because usually they'll block any charges unless you've told them ahead of time. Um, some tips. So you should assume that drinking water is unsafe, um, which means that any vegetables or fruits that aren't cooked are also unsafe because they were probably washed in that unsafe drinking water. Um, so uh, each Team, team trip leader will have a water filter that you guys can use to filter your own water, which means you really do want to bring a water bottle so that you can um, clean, have clean water in that water bottle. Um, but this is definitely something to be cautious on so you stay healthy for the trip because it's such a short trip that if you get sick for a few days, that's half your trip. Um, no, nothing, nothing expensive, at least in sight or brought. So you know, like a brass rat or nice jewelry or watch or whatever, leave here. If you need to bring that cell phone so you have it while you're in the States, while you're traveling, just keep it hidden in your bag so that um, it's not brought attention to, being brought attention to at all. Um, you should always be traveling in groups, ideally, um, but especially at night. Um, there's going to be some cases where that'll be tricky, but um, do your best to be as safe as possible. Um, 
as I mentioned, <laughs> flexibility and patience are really great assets to have. Um, so just sort of go in not expecting to be as efficient or effective as you ne necessarily hoped and sort of expect that things are going to change at the last minute and that'll help make the trip more fun rather than frustrating. Um, and then managing expectations with the community partners. Um, it's really easy for community partners to be like, when are you coming back? And you're so pumped and you're having such a great time and you're like, I'll be back this summer. Like not thinking about, well, actually I have that internship at whoever and I'm not going to be back this summer and may never be back. And so you don't want to make any promises that you can't keep. That's really important um, because that can ruin our relationship with our community partners. Um, so just a reminder, a few of you still owe me at least some of these things and so please get them to me today or tell me why you can't <laughs> and what you're going to do if you haven't already. Um, and so for the remainder of the class, um, I need to do micro interviews with everyone who's traveling. Um, it's just a D-Lab thing that we do. We just talk one-on-one -on -one really briefly. Um, you may want to revise your plan a little bit based on feedback from the presentations. Um, you probably want to talk in your group about how much checked luggage you're having versus carry-on, who's carrying what for any bulky items you have. Things that you might need from D-Lab, I need you to tell me by the end of class today. So you might need tools, you might need cameras, we have some that we can lend. Um, mosquito nets, hammocks, other. It'd be nice if at least a few people have cameras so that um, you can get different angles of shots when you're all taking pictures together. And also, um, if one dies, you're not unable to take pictures because pictures are really important for the projects. Um, and then anything else you might need. So, are there any questions about all that? Okay, cool.